are here today for the Azkara, for the memorial of David Ben Yafa, E.J. Cohen. To pay him our respects and to pay respects to his family who continue to mourn his tragic loss. To Zeshapayel, to Alexis, and to the girls, to Linda, to Lori, and to Caroline, to his parents, to Judah and to Linda Cohen, and to his siblings, to Robin, to Sarah, and to Ike. Our rabbis tell us that sometimes tell us that wicked people, even while they're alive, are considered dead. And righteous people, even when they have passed, are considered living. Someone who is living a life devoid of God, who is living a life of immorality or of pure evil, although they might be physically alive, they are spiritually non-existent and therefore considered dead. However, a righteous person, a tzaddik, who has lived their life walking together with their creator, someone who is able to accomplish things, to make the world a better place. That righteous person, even if they're gone, their legacy continues. They still live within us. They continue to make their mark, and their impact is still felt. As we sit here now, close to a year from the time of DJ's passing, this idea seems to be perfectly describing what DJ has left us with. He may not be in the room physically at present, but it is without a doubt that we can feel his presence. There are those of you that are here tonight that in this past year probably went through different challenges and certain moments of difficulty. I imagine that th th those moments had the potential to put you in a bad mood, allow you to become negative, or even have the feeling as if you wanted to give up. But then you thought of DJ and how he handled his difficulties and his challenges, and it gave you the hope and strength you needed to turn those moments into fleeting ones. How many people still, after DJ's passing, say to themselves, I wonder how DJ would handle this. The lessons that DJ left us of how to live life are lessons you would have thought came from someone who lived a life until 120 years, not 41. He left us with the idea that life is too serious to be taken so seriously. He understood the importance of adding laughter to our lives. He made us realize that although those moments of laughter may not always change the situation or the challenge in our lives, but they would certainly alter the circumstances by which we would allow ourselves to experience those difficulties. He left us with the understanding of the importance of making others feel special. He knew the exact words to use to make whoever he was speaking to feel good about their strengths. He had the innate ability to uplift all those that he encountered. And when he complimented you, it was genuine, it was real, and highlighted something about you that was true. And in turn, you wanted to do the same to others. We learned how to do that from DJ. When we pray on a daily basis, our Amidah is broken up into three parts. Sheva, Bakasha, and Hoda, which means praise of Hashem, requests from Hashem, and thanks to Hashem. Many of us spend the bulk of our concentration on that middle part of Amidah, requesting all the things that we potentially need, health, wealth, peace of mind, etc. We spend less time on the last part of Amidah, it focuses on those things which should be th we should be thankful for. In truth, it should be reversed. 
There is so much for us to be thanking Hashem for on a regular basis, and yet it seems we take those things for granted. EJ certainly had a lot of things that he could have been asking for, especially, especially once he was diagnosed. But when you spoke to him, when you listened to his conversations, the bulk of his time was spent thanking Hashem, thanking Alexis, and thanking anyone and everyone for what they had and for what they had done for him. He left us stressing the importance of being thankful and taking the time to do so. And DJ left us with the idea that the only way to navigate life is by placing our trust in Hashem and by believing that whatever happens to us is ultimately for our own good. He lived that, he preached that, and even now after his passing, we carry that idea on stronger because of DJ. He left us with the idea that it is our responsibility to tap into those talents and abilities that Hashem created us with, and that by doing so, we will ultimately achieve our greatest happiness. He sang songs, he wrote poems, and he, consult, he counseled people that confided in him because he knew those were strengths that Hashem had blessed him with. He left us with the idea that you don't have to be a rabbinic scholar to inspire people to learn Torah and do mitzvot. The fervor that he expressed himself with when he recited, when he recited the Katpalanim, the excitement he showed when putting on his tefillin, and the absolute joy he exuded when he went up to the Torah moved others to want to have their turn at it as well. He turned these actions into the in thing to do. He left us with the idea that doing kindness for others is the greatest healer. We watched him bring joy and happiness to others as he focused on their pain and it distracted as it distracted from his own. And finally, DJ left us with the idea that friends and family are the most important thing in our lives. Wherever you would see DJ, on the fields, in the synagogue, at community events, or even at the hospital, he was always surrounded by a multitude of friends. They flocked to him, and he cherished each of them as the list of friends grew larger and the bond between them grew stronger. They did kindness for each other and shared moments of crying and laughter as his friends were there until the very last moments of his life. And finally, DJ and his family. He took care of Alexis, and she certainly took care of him. They were a couple to emulate. They grew together, and they brought out the best in each other. They built a most beautiful family, and the girls are truly a reflection of the midot and character they work so hard to instill in them. They mirror what they see and carry on the legacy of their father. Throughout the year, you girls have shown your father the greatest respect. He called and asked about each scenario to make sure to follow the halakha exactly as it was supposed to be. May Hashem bless you as you continue to grow and continue to make your father proud. Alexis, you have been rock solid. You have carried yourself with the greatest dignity and poise. May Hashem grant you continued strength as you continue to be the great mother that you are. E.J. Cohen has physically passed, but the life that he led and the lessons he's taught are still and will continue to be very much alive and well. I first want to thank Alexis and the family for asking me to speak about our dear friend, DJ Cohen. DJ has meant so many things to so many people, from his emunah Hashem to his positive attitude, to his hilarious, smart, caring, optimistic, outgoing, a great father, as you can see from his three awesome daughters, and he was just a super inspirational to all of us, as we all heard so many amazing stories over the past year. 
But David Bailey called me last week, asked me to speak. So many DJ stories came running through my mind. I was having trouble getting words on paper. But I think this story is so many examples of what an amazing person DJ is. A few summers ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to take DJ to Camp Simcoe on the bike for Hydra. DJ was invited by Morris Tavish and the SY Cycling team to give a speech during the event. I'm sure most of you know, it's a two-day bike trip where the riders ride about 200 miles and finish with a party at Camps and Cloud. Our first trip, DJ was asked to speak at the dinner after the first day of riding at a hotel in the mountains. We decided to go earlier that day and drive up to visit Camps and Cloud and then head to the dinner. The long drives with DJ is just an unbelievable experience. I'm sure a lot of us were able to do that. Listening to music, singing as loud as we can, to the deep conversations about everything going on. DJ was my therapist with how deep and thought out we went on different things I was dealing with. Even though he was dealing with the ultimate challenge, he was more interested in talking about what the person he was with was dealing with and how we could help, no matter how small or big the issue was. And I think that was one of his biggest qualities as a person. He really had great advice and cared to everyone around him. It was amazing to watch. During that car ride up, he gets a phone call from a spam telemarketing call, and he answers. And he lets the guy start his pitch, and then he interrupts him in the middle, and he just says, your pitch stinks. <laughs> and then he continues with the guy on the phone for five to 10 minutes, explaining him how he should pitch his product on the next call. The telemarketer thanked him, and was honestly so appreciative of the advice that DJ gave him. I was cracking up, but it's something I would never forget, it's, Truly, who DJ was. We get to Camp Simcha now that morning as we were about to walk in. DJ turns to me and says, "I don't want to use the C card today. I'm here for these children dealing with the challenges and the great people here that take care of them." Camp Simcha though did not get the message from Bike for Kai that we were coming to visit the camp, and they weren't letting us get in. Both of us standing there dressed up as ketchup and mustard. <laughs> we were trying to get people on the phone. DJ was trying to do everything he can. He turns to the guy, he just says, do you know who I am? I'm DJ, David Cohen. The guy's like, yeah, okay. You don't know me, David Cohen? And I'm like, DJ, you might have to tell the guy. And he goes, I don't want to use the seat card. Okay, person was getting angry, he turns and he tells DJ, sorry guys, there's an event tomorrow, we're not letting you in. So DJ said, you know, in some ways, this is my gift, need to get in there. He says, sir, my name is DJ Cohen. I have stage four pancreatic cancer. I'm not taking no for an answer. Please get someone here to let us in. Obviously, they let us into the camp. We took a tour of the camp. It was an unbelievable experience. DJ speaking with everybody, to the doctors, to the counselors, to the volunteers, making everyone smile. And they then invited us to a disco party and lunch. DJ was dancing like a maniac with these children, talking with them, making them happy, singing anything he could do. And he was starting to get tired, and he kept taking breaks. And I kept pulling him aside and saying, DJ, you have to speak at a dinner in a few hours. Take it easy. But DJ had this built-in power switch, power switch. He just couldn't stop. Every time he saw a new kid get on that dance floor, he ran back and he danced with them just to make them happy. After lunch, we got in the car and headed to the hotel where he was giving a speech later that night. DJ was exhausted, but during that ride, we stopped a dozen times. We were in a beautiful area in the mountains somewhere upstate, with gorgeous waterfalls, overlooks, walk bridges, and more. He just had, DJ had us stop at every site. We got out, he thanked us him. His appreciation for the beauty in nature was just awesome. He would just sit there and pray through these beautiful sites. Some of them even brought him to tears. We get to the hotel, there's over a thousand people there, by Fakai, but they didn't know who DJ was. Not yet. As he starts seeing some of the Syrian bike riders came in, his power switch turns on again. So grateful and thankful, jumping, turn around. He's networking with everybody, from the riders to the family members to the volunteers. He made a connection with hundreds of people. He gave an amazing speech, including his poem Battle Star. We drove home blasting Pearl Jam, and it was an unforgettable day. The next year, they invited DJ back. This time they wanted him to bite in the hunt, fight for Chai the last mile and a half with the Royals. We got there the night before, late that, late that night as everyone was finishing dinner. The whole place lit up when DJ walked in. Everyone excited to see him. The effect he had on everyone was insane. Fight for Chai had professional athletes there, 
including a Monty tour from the New York Giants, who made sure he walked to the other opposite side of the room to give DJ a new job. The next morning, we drive up to Camp Sinclair, again stopping at every beautiful site we saw. We get to the staging area about a mile and a half away from camp, where all the riders meet before heading into camp together. I had the car, so I had to drive up to Camp Sinclair before they closed all the roads. I'm in the camp hanging out. All of a sudden, I get a phone call. My phone rings. The cell phone signal stinks, but I finally hear Morris Tavish telling me, we messed up. There's no bike here for DJ to ride it on. I'm running around the camp asking people if there's extra bike, looking for one, no luck. I find one bike, it's chained to a fence. No one had the key. I say, okay, I'm gonna come back in the car and pick DJ up. Sorry, the roads are closed, you can't do it. Now I just keep calling. I'm, all, I'm getting all nervous worrying about DJ. No one's answering the phone anymore and the signal blacks out. I see the beginning riders starting to come in. I'm completely stressed out and then all of a sudden, that DJ power switch turns on again. You see him running into camp, on foot while everybody's on bikes. It was over a mile on hilly roads. It, it was insane. Everybody was going nuts. The reaction was just unbelievable. He runs through the finish line. He gets a beautiful bike for high med medal, and we walk into the party. He's spent. We're sitting on the side, I'm pouring water on his head while he's drinking Gatorade, trying to get hydrated. He's exhausted. Any of us would have been. Then the music comes on, and all these kids from the camp are in the tent dancing. And there it is again, the DJ, DJ Power Switch. Like a bowl of energy, he's dancing and singing with everyone, jumping on stage, having a blast. As it was getting towards the end of that party, he wanted to speak. The MC of the party wouldn't let him. Oh, we all know how that happens. He jumped on stage as everyone was about to walk out and saying their goodbyes. He grabs the microphone, pulls everyone back in, gives an amazing speech about him and how to close out the day. Everyone was inspired. We walked to the car, he was just smiling, exhausted. We started running home again, stopping at every beautiful view, lake, or waterfall, to thank Hashem and appreciate nature and life. We've all seen that DJ power switch, with everything he was going through to always give back, make people smile, be interested in their lives, and wanting to help in any way he can. That was DJ, a great friend, mentor, and sometimes my therapist. The week after DJ passed, Mike Trevi sent out an email to all the Reuters. The email was forwarded to me and I just broke down. From a few short hours he spent with the Bike for Thai organization, the effect he had on everyone was endless. The email said the following. Dear writer, last week many of us in Bike for Thai family were saddened by the loss of a truly remarkable man. David DJ Cohen was a friend and inspiration to many. He was a young father who battled cancer for a few years but did it with the biggest smile. He came to live every moment in gratefulness and happiness, and he wanted everyone around him to feel the same. He joined us on Bike for Thai in typical DJ style when he didn't have a bike to cross the finish line. He just ran in on foot alongside everyone else on their bikes. The happiest man you could be. An unimaginable loss for his children and family and a real loss to all of us. This balance between the happiness and sadness is part of being human. It is part of what made DJ special, and I also believe it's a huge part of the makeup of Bike for Thai. We fundraise and train to do so much for our children and families who are fighting battles that are unimaginable to us. Yet both sides feel encouraged and draw strength from each other. Let's draw from DJ's strength and keep his vibrancy alive and make everything about this year the best one yet. Thank you. Super Bowl from a few years ago. Like all times, we try and get together, we try and make a plan, and we can never make it happen. DJ decided he's not having any of that. And he's going to come in from New Jersey and come meet up with the boys and watch the game. He ended up bringing little football cookies that Alexis made for us. He brought his tripod, he brought his camera, and he was alive for the party. He didn't have to come, he wasn't feeling well, remember. He didn't look good, but he made the best of it, and we had a great time. I also remember from last year, 
I was in Florida for the championship game to get into the Super Bowl. I'm driving, I'm driving back to the hotel and my phone is buzzing, it's buzzing, it's buzzing. What's going on? I don't know, I'm not answering that phone. Finally pull up and I see it's DJ. Dave, I need you. Dave, where are you? Dave, I need to talk to you, it's an emergency. And I start panicking. I pick up my phone, I call them, and what does DJ ask me? Dave, do you have a Hulu account? I go, that's what you want from me? Do I have a Hulu account? He goes, uh, yeah, I want to watch the game with you. I said, well, DJ, I'm in Florida, you're in, you're in Jersey. He says, so big deal. I'm going to put the game on, we're going to stream it, and I'm going to watch it with you. This is the kind of guy DJ was, and I'm thinking about it a little later. This was about a month before he passed away. He was thinking about watching a game with me, because he knew that that's what I would love. David, DJ Cohen, and I have been best friends since 1982. From that first day in first grade until we graduated high school, we were always in the same class. Except for Matt Norman, DJ was always smarter than me and Matt. Outside of school, we grew up in each other's homes. Mr. and Mrs. Cohen were always so warm and welcoming. Robin and Sarah were a bit older and a little bit cooler, and Ike was such a cute baby. I even remember chatting and laughing with Grandma Sarah. I always remember having a great time, hanging out in DJ's room or playing video games. When I wasn't there, DJ was by me. We spent a few hours last Hanukkah when we were together. And that's what DJ wanted to talk about. He wanted to talk about days that we used to color in our giant coloring books, the type of coloring book that used to go on the floor and get in it to color. And we'd watch He-Man and Thundercats and his favorite, Chiro. <laughs> Google it if you don't know what it is. In the springtime, we'd watch the Mets. Even going to a few games as well as a few opening days together. The past few years, I would come in and we would watch opening day together. One year, we were at the Pichotto House. We're having the Met game. It's pretty much a normal. DJ had his hand on the remote, ready to change the channel if anyone walked in. If anyone doesn't know, the Pichotto House is strictly a Yankee house. But DJ, I forced DJ. Fast forward a few years, and the Shamma Court was the place to be. Not because of me, but only because of DJ. The games did not start until DJ arrived, which was no problem. He was there at 11.30, rolling in on his blades with his Jordan team from his neck. After a quick hello to my parents, he was off to get everything set up, making sure the basketballs were pumped up, setting up the water and all the chairs. We played until nightfall, in the rain, in the snow, even on the ice. When it finally became too dark to play, we would go inside and watch Michael Jordan's playground over and over and over again. Some of my greatest memories are from that court, and it's all started by DJ. DJ was always a trendsetter. He was the first guy, he had all the blades. We grew out our hair because of him, and we shaved our hair because of him. We started wearing bandanas. He loved Michael Jordan and the Bulls. First, Air Jordan sneakers, Pearl Jam, Doc Morgans, on and on and on. I also think DJ was the first one of us to have a girlfriend in the fourth grade. Even now, we all have beards because DJ was the first to have one. DJ and I used to spend a lot of time together on the summer weekends. He used to stay by me for what felt like every week. He had a spot at the table, at my house and my grandparents, my aunts and uncles' homes. He hit it off with everyone. My extended family were among the first to reach out to him when DJ was diagnosed because they knew how close we are and they felt close as well. No doubt he was my brother. Our two favorite stories happened in the summer. Back in July 1993, there was a party one Saturday night in West Hill. It was actually in the youth center over here. We were planning to attend. That day, DJ changed our minds and decided we were going to see Weekend at Bernie's too. <laughs> then we were going to go to the park. Okay. My mother dropped us off in Long Branch at the theater on Ocean Avenue in Brighton. We watched the movie, we cracked up, of course, and had a great time. Now it's time to go to the party. I was going to call my parents for the lift, but DJ wouldn't have it. DJ decided, West Deal is right near Long Branch. <laughs> right here. Let's walk. We'll be there in 10 minutes. Well, you know what happened. The movie ended at 11. Long story short, we never made it to the party. 
We got home at 4 a.m. I wasn't too thrilled, of course, but we were exhausted and I went to bed. And we couldn't even talk about it anymore. When I woke up, DJ was gone. He took the first lift to Brooklyn, but he left me a note with a large rock he took home from our adventure, telling me to never forget that night. All was forgiven, of course, and I still have that rock. As Jaime mentioned last year, DJ was extremely confident in his basketball skills. Making the varsity team when he didn't make JV and U2 him, it's still a crazy story. I don't even know what to say. So I used to tease DJ a lot. And I mentioned to him I had a friend in Ken, we'll call him Joe, that was a better point guard. And no way DJ could beat him. What? Are you crazy? I'm so much better. This went on for a few summers. One day I went to my group in the JCC gym and DJ walks in. It was a Thursday and I really wasn't expecting him until Friday. I asked him why he was there. He responded, I'm here to challenge Joe to a one-on-one. -on -one. And I couldn't believe it. It wasn't such a smart thing to do. And so they played. I'll be nice, I'll give DJ one basket and say he lost 11 to 1, but I pretty much think it was a shot. I won't mention the guy's name because I don't even think he was being challenged. DJ comes up the court, guys can picture him, looks right at me. He says, God, Dave, he stinks. I'm so much better than him. And the funny thing is, he still believed in all these years. I was told. Besides reminiscing, all we talked about was our families, our girls. DJ loved Ruby from day one and always loved hanging out with us. But when we started dating, I'm pretty sure he was at our first date back in the Shalom and Andes. Alexis loves telling the story. Uh, DJ wanted to introduce her to me and Ruby when they got back from Israel after they had met. All the while, we really knew each other from before, but I think we made believe we did, so DJ can make the introduction. We all clicked right away and always loved hanging out. Every email DJ sent me would always include a note telling me how lucky we are to have our wives. I couldn't agree more. We all saw firsthand how awesome Alexis was and is. The boys were in awe every time we came to visit, from taking DJ to every appointment, to taking care of the house and the girls, even dealing with DJ's forever ongoing quest to find the right recliner. <laughs> Did you ever get one? A few of the boys have all daughters, no sons. I believe we're at 24 girls at this point. We formed an unofficial club, and we're all very proud and loving members of that club. DJ always beamed when telling us about his girls, Linda, Lori, and Caroline. He loves sending me pictures and telling me about their special days together, whether playing basketball, going for a run on the boardwalk, or going camping. They were his life. I have countless pictures of my phone of DJ Alexis and the girls. He loved you so much, he was so proud of you. DJ would also always want to know how my girls were. He wanted their names so he could pray for them every day. He even did my daughter Sophia's homework one night. The assignment was to write a poem. Who better than DJ? No joke, he was in my house that night. He was standing in my kitchen and thought of one on the spot. I have the pictures, and all my girls are just smiling ear to ear. Needless to say, but Sophia, she got it. I was once asked what I admired most about DJ. The answer came to me rather easily because it's something I've loved about DJ for a long time. DJ always had this ability to be nice. He never, ever said anything derogatory, anything mean to me. Dave, you look great. You look awesome. I could have gained 10 pounds and he just always complimented me. You yeah, have awesome shoes, great car, your haircut, your beard, sick, it made you feel like a million bucks. It's really a rare quality in a person. Sometimes a person can say something without thinking and hurt another. DJ never allowed himself to do that. All he, all he was about was love. One last story. July 3rd, 2017. I got a call from DJ around 9 a.m. He didn't sound so great. He was in Park Avenue Shore waiting to see me. We didn't have a plan to meet, so unfortunately I was already an hour away. I felt terrible not being there, but he understood. I told him to go find my brother-in-law, David Levy, he would help him, he would take care of him. I knew he'd share him. A few minutes later, I got a selfie from DJ, of the two of them, they had never met before. But they were smiling and smiling, they loved him. Hit it off right away. 
He was smiling, he told me, no, I am okay, don't come in. He continued by telling me he was sending me a poem he had written, but I should not share it with anyone. Only when the time came. The day after the funeral, as we were waiting to pray, Alexis was telling us that no Indonesian, he had to have written something for his funeral. Some sort of eulogy. She looked around the house but couldn't find anything. I decided that now was the time. I had it all along in my inbox. The body of the email before the poem says, remember how lucky we are to have been blessed with amazing wives and children. And then the poem is titled, Prepare. When I die, please don't wear black. It's so boring, it lacks tact. Wear a bright color, something that represents love. Let me know, I can see you from up above. Don't be sad or mad, be glad we share the time we had. Comfort my wife and children with a warm embrace. Don't depress them with morbid stories of confused grace. Leave my home with a thought, a bridal one I taught. Live life for you and yours. There is no second chance when we go through the exit doors. It was written by DJ Cohen on February 8th, 2016. DJ, I'm always thinking about you. I miss you. Lessons have been beyond influential in raising my family and just life in general. We would go to yoga, take walks, and simply talk about life. I really miss him. He was an awesome basketball player, and nothing beat watching him and his friends play every Saturday at our house. When DJ was diagnosed with cancer, I froze for a bit. It was all any of us could think about. But seeing how much he pushed through, and worked so hard to enjoy uh, his time with his family and friends changed so much for me. I just couldn't believe the perseverance that poured out of DJ. It was amazing to see his positive outlook on life. He loved my kids as if they were his own. He was always making sure to put Joanne's hair in a ponytail so he could see her beautiful face. He was the only one who could get her, uh, he was the only one who could get her hair up. Little Lori was always escaping up the steps to his bedroom. She still tries to go visit Uncle DJ upstairs when we go to Aunt Leslie's house. DJ and my son David had the most special bond of all. David would do whatever Uncle DJ was doing. Uncle DJ took his shirt off during basketball, and David took his shirt off. He idolized Uncle DJ. If DJ rake leaves, then David rake leaves. If DJ was organizing, DJ was organizing, then David was organizing. DJ would know how to get down to David's level and relate to him. DJ found a way to relate to most people, honestly. When I think of DJ, I think of this beautiful human being that was brought on earth to bring us all these valuable lessons about life. Lessons that we all are benefiting from today. Uh, my son, my nephew David, uh, wrote this about by David Levy when my uncle died. When my uncle died, I had to persevere. When my uncle, uh, I, had to, I had to persevere when my uncle died. My uncle died with cancer, 
here by trying to forget about what happened. Perseverance is when something is hard, but you keep trying. My uncle was always a happy person. When he died from cancer, it was very sad. Even though I try to forget about how he died, I don't want to forget about his amazing life. I'm continuing to persevere by learning from my uncle to always be happy. It was a very hard time. I wish I could have said, I wish I could have said goodbye to him. Perseverance is hard, and I have to keep trying to not think about the sad part and only the good parts. so long since he left, but at the same time, it feels like it was yesterday. So much has happened since he went back to Hashem. I'm on the basketball team. I can do a crossover, double crossover, maybe even dribble through my legs. I wish you were here so I could show you. I remember when you took me to the Harry Franco Park, and we just played basketball all day. He challenged me to move one-on-one, -on -one, and I was sure that I would win. After I lost badly, he told me that it didn't matter, win or lose, and that all that mattered was if I had fun and tried my best. I don't really talk about this, but whenever I play basketball, I think of this story, and play to make you proud. The love for the game that you and mom have instilled in me will stay forever. With Sarah Fatty as our coach, we are learning how to apply basketball lessons to daily lives. And every time I think of you, your life motto is to always think positive and be in the present. I see and hear more about these things every single day. As time goes by, there are more and more signs showing me that you're still here, and I love it. I'm going to be honest. Sometimes it's hard to stay positive all the time. I mean, it's hard to be happy without having you here. Sometimes I'll see something that reminds me of you and just start crying. And there's other times when I'll just start crying for no reason. <coughs> yes, of course it's hard, but because of you, Mommy, Lori, Carolyn, and I have a huge support system and an even bigger family. If something is wrong, there's no way that someone won't notice because everyone cares so much for, uh, for us. And it's all thanks to you. You spread love and positivity, positivity to every single person that you met. I can't remember a time when we had a conversation and you didn't make me smile, laugh, or didn't say I love you. In our Jewish outlook class, we're learning about something called prism theory. The prism theory is when there's an ordinary crystal prism, but once sunlight hits, all of a sudden a beautiful light comes through, comes from it. Just like how there is beauty in that, there is good in every situation, and you saw that. You turned the problem into a challenge, and our family even named cancer our stinky kid. You are constant to chemo and made everyone stay happier. You would train yourself to find the good side of everything. And I always remember you telling me that you learned all of that from mommy. The love you had for her was unmeasurable, as was the love you had for everyone around you. I know that you're doing just fine up there, and I wish you the best. I miss you so much. But I know that I'll, I'll see you again one day when my shia comes. I love you forever. Love you, though.
12 months gone in a second. You've always been the light for my life when I needed it the most. You were and are my role model throughout my life. Every day when people tell me that I have your traits, personality, and your positivity, it makes me smile from the inside out. This year has been full of ups and downs, and I wish that I could tell you all about it. I wish I could just talk to you face to face one more time. Everybody knew you for your positive outlook on life. And that's how I want to live mine. You always brought out the best in people and showed them not to give up. You were an angel sent from above, guiding us in all the right directions. You made everyone realize that they have a purpose and needed to live their days like it's their lives. In these last four years, you put more smiles on people's faces than anyone could count. You always asked about mine, Caroline's, and Linda's days whenever we came home from school, even though you just got through chemo. You were so calm, patient, caring, funny, and the best dad a kid could ever ask for. I know you're watching us all from up above and making sure we're okay. Please help Mashiach come soon. Your twin daughter, Laura. You're for it, Lori. Lori, I'm thankful and blessed and honored to read that for you. So, in honor of DJ, I didn't really prepare a specific speech, so I hope you don't regret asking me to come up here. <laughs> uh, my name is Douglas Haddad, for those who don't know me. DJ and I have also been best friends for about 40 years. Um, this last year has been one of the saddest, loneliest years of my life. I know I'm not alone when I say that. There's a hole that just will never be filled and he will forever be missed by everyone who knew him. Stay positive, stay positive. <laughs> Uh, when DJ and I used to hang out, we would just plug into each other. It was time would sort of stand still. We call it DJ Duck Time. If I pick him up and we go for a walk in the woods or we're going anywhere, Alexis knows if he, she needs him, not really going to get him so quickly right back. And I think it had to do with us really appreciating and being grateful that we had the chance to be together. We lived in Jersey, I lived in Brooklyn. We couldn't always uh, be together. The thing that I think about most about DJ is how he connected people. Uh, Rabbi, you mentioned it, that you know he would change the topic to kind of take away his thoughts from his illness. And I think you kind of got it right, but there's a, there's a race called Tough Mother. And there's this obstacle that has uh, electrocution wires coming out of it. And it's a crazy thing, people shouldn't do it, but there's this thing that happens where they line up 10 people and they sort of connect their arms together and you run through as one unit. So when the electricity goes into you, it sort of dissipates into the other people. And I think DJ really, by connecting with so many people, he could, gain strength from that emunah. And um, I think that's really the message that I want to share with Linda, Lori, and Caroline, is that you need to stay connected to each other and to everyone. And it's okay to be different. You don't have to be the same. I DJ love Michael Jordan. I'm a diehard Knicks fan. You know, that was a major non-negotiable thing in our relationship. But you don't have to be identical to everyone, and it's okay to have space for yourself in your life. Um, it's really impossible to put into words the connection that DJ had with all of us. Um, I was going to share a few stories. I hope they're the right ones. Uh, one time, we went for a walk in the woods, and 
Japanese call it Shinrin Yoku. It's like a forest bathing. It's uh, they believe that you should walk in nature once a day the same way you like take a shower once a day. It cleanses you. So DJ and I are walking in the woods and we get to a lake. And those of you who know me, I like to play with bubbles. So we're blowing bubbles on the water. And I don't know if you know about bubbles. If you blow bubbles on a the lake, they you just keep going. It's like a surface tension thing. I don't know. It's probably in the Kabbalah Rabbi. I don't know. <laughs> But anyways, we're, we're leaving the woods and we see this woman and normally when you see somebody in the woods, you know, you just kind of keep going, you don't really socialize, but <laughs> DJ stopped and she would look really heavy and he connected with her and he went into her and he forced me to give me my bubbles to her, <laughs> he told her about the lake and everything and and she definitely was blessed to have met DJ that day. Um, I have another story that I'm not sure if it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi said pass in honor of DJ. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Basically, uh, DJ and I, his doctor, the chemo, was like sort of towards the end, the chemo was sort of not happening, wasn't working anymore. Um, so DJ was instructed, I guess, to go to Kapalu in Massachusetts. And we did this meditation, uh, this uh, guided meditation. Meditation is like 45 minutes where you get comfortable, and there's a guide, and they kind of walk you through this uh, spirit animal meditation. And for 45 minutes, the meditation goes, and you go into the clouds, and, and then they, you land on this island, and you walk through the woods, and you come to a body of water, and you go to the body of water, and it's a whole long thing. To make a long story short, I see this crazy golden gorilla. He was crazy, wasn't what I was expecting. Anyways, I come out of meditation, I wait for DJ, he comes out of meditation, I can't wait to talk to him. I'm like, Gage, like, that was crazy. Like, you know, what did you see? Who did you, like, what happened with you? Like, you know, what animals did you see? And DJ told me, he said, Doug, he said, once we went into the clouds, I never came down. You know, at that time, we didn't really talk about it. And, you know, I think it, it goes to what he was saying, Rabbi, and also Rel. You know, DJ had a tremendous emuna, and he was so connected with Hashem that he didn't need to come back down to figure out who he was or what was going on. He just kept lying. And, Um, my dad died four years ago. His yotzai was last week. And the pain from that never really goes away. You kind of always have it with you, at least for me. But you have to kind of choose to take it as a reminder to live an extraordinary life, to take risks, to have no fear, no regret, no worry. But get faith in Hashem, be present, be in the moment. And in DJ's words, be awesome. Definitely be awesome. And there's sort of um, an undulation to life. There are beginnings and endings. There are openings and closings. Mekabim, uh, mekabim, kabulim, kabulim. That ends the Torah portion of my yes. <laughs> It basically means opening Sha'afiru, Sha'afat. Not even for one hour would you survive if you didn't, if your body didn't operate the way I should have designated it to. But I think um, you have to realize that when life kind of crushes you down, that at the end of that, there's going to be an expansion. 
and you have to let that flow through you and not be afraid of what happens after that feeling's there. And it's very similar to the wings of a bird. In order for a bird to fly, he has to open and close his wings. And you have to realize that experiencing those things is what it takes to really fly. And I wanted my last words to be, fly, DJ, fly. Thank you. 